let's move on to looking at the metabolism in terms of the absorptive and post-absorptive states. And I'm going to use the word fed and fasted because I think they are terms that we use more readily in our everyday um, life. And so when I say fed, I'm referring to the absorptive state or post-absorptive state, excuse me. And when I say fasted, I'm referring to the absorptive state, the actions of actually absorbing the food that we would have ingested. So during the absorptive state or the fed state, energy is being stored. This is immediately after you had a meal. Think about um, late at night, you just had dinner, your energy is being stored, macromolecules such as carbohydrates, proteins, fats are being digested, broken down. And so this is a time for storing up that energy that can be used for a later period. In the post-absorptive state, this is also referred to as the fasted state, these energy stores are now being mobilized. So this is a time where you've gone for a while without food, typically beyond 12 to 14 hours. And now you're going to be relying on the energy that was stored when you just had a meal, energy that was stored in that absorptive or fed state. So this is where you're now going to be breaking down fat that was stored up, breaking down glycogen, when glucose gets stored as glycogen, you can break that down and liberate that glucose to use it during that fasted state. So these are the two general body states when we look at metabolism. And so we're going to be speaking about the different hormones that are at play in each of these states. Now, we can also think about this in terms of our energetic needs. In the absorptive state or the fed state, our energy input is outweighing our output in terms of nutrients, and the nutrients are actively being absorbed. Glucose is the main example of our energy source. Um, so most of what we eat is converted to glucose and that glucose can be absorbed. Most of what we need is used immediately and then the rest can be stored. Um, so the liver is where we have, and muscle is where we have glycogen being stored. And then in our adipose tissue, this is where we have triglycerides being stored. And so this is where we typically see um, uh, energy imbalances happening. So if you have too much of an energetic input state, then you're going to see excess triglycerides being stored. That's where we have that excess fat being stored. And that's where you start to increase your weight. Um, if you have excess of glucogen or uh, glucose, excuse me, being stored, that's going to have more glycogen being deposited in the liver as well as the muscles. So this is where we can start to look at our imbalances as far as energy input versus energy output and what uh, the manifestations of that will be. Here is a nice flow chart uh, to show what's happening in the absorptive state. So all of our nutrients are being absorbed. Again, things like glucose. We've also got proteins, fats being absorbed, as well as vitamins and minerals. Um, the glucose will be used by the body. So the first um, role for glucose that we eat uh, or that comes in in the diet is that it is used for our immediate needs. Um, so that can be liberated into energy by cellular respiration. Some of that can also be stored as glycogen in the liver and muscles, and then some of it can be stored in the form of triglycerides. That's going to be deposited into our adipose tissue mainly, but also to, in the liver and in some smaller components. The fatty acids from the fat that's coming in from our diet, that will again be stored as triglycerides in adipose tissue. The amino acids that are coming in from protein in the diet, that can be stored in muscle mainly, um, and some other cells as well, such as kidney cells. And then the liver is where that amino acid can be converted to fatty acids and then also be stored as fat. So notice how fats are stored as fats. But protein can be stored as fat, and then glucose can also be stored as fat. So fat is the ultimate storage form for any excess nutrients that we receive, okay? Um, let's talk about the opposite state. So the post-absorptive or the fasted state. This is where our energy output is exceeding the energy input. So this is a typical uh, state that your body is in if you've gone for anywhere from 12 to 14 hours without having an immediate meal. Glucose is going to be spared for the brain. We talked about this idea that the brain is um, sort of selective in its 
preference for energy and it really prefers glucose over any other nutrient. Other tissues in the body can use fatty acids adequately and efficiently, but as far as the brain, it's really going to prefer glucose and that glucose is going to be sort of shuttled off to the brain as a first preference. Uh, nutrients are gonna begin to be broken down. Um, so we can liberate any of those stored energetic molecules. We're gonna break down um, the liver, um, our storage of glycogen in the liver. We're gonna break down storage of triglycerides in our adipose tissue and liver. And we're gonna break down those to liberate nutrients. All right, so here's what that looks like. Here's a schematic that shows what that looks like. So notice we have a lot of different sources that we can tap into to release um, nutrients that we can use in that, that fasted state. So our muscles. Now I wanna give um, a caution here. Our muscles are really the last resort for energetic needs. And we do not tap, typically tap into muscles for our immediate needs. We usually will tap into muscle when we have gone an extended period um, in the post-absorptive state. But Nevertheless, we can tap into muscle, we can break that protein down into amino acids, and we can use those amino acids in terms of uh, other tissues, not the brain, to liberate energy. We can also break down fat, uh, adipose tissue, the triglyceride that's stored there into fatty acids and glycerol. The fatty acids can directly be liberated, again, in non-brain tissue to make energy. The other component of, triglyceride, uh, of triglycerides is glycerol, and that glycerol can be shuttled to the liver and used to make ketones, as well as converted into glucose, which can directly be used by tissues, including the brain. So that glycerol can do two different things depending on the, um, the states of the body. If there is no glycogen coming in, the body has zero glucose stores, then that glycogen glycerol will more likely be shuttled to the ketones and that ketones can be used by the brain. If there is glycogen being stored and there is glucose coming in, then that glucose can more so be used in the brain um, instead of being the ketones mainly. The liver is where we have glycogen being stored, so that can be liberated into glucose. And then in muscle, we can also store some glycogen as well. And by way of the lactate dehydrogenase pathway, we can shuttle that off to make glucose, which can be used for energy. Now, just to point this out again here, the nervous tissue prefers glucose. And as a second preference, it'll take ketones, but it really cannot use um, amino acids directly or fatty acids directly. Fatty acids can be converted into ketones and then they can be used for energy, right? So really important to bear that in mind. If we have zero glucose coming in and our body is shifted into what's called a ketotic state or ketosis, then we'll take those fatty acids, make ketones, and then that can be used by the brain. Okay, I'm gonna pause and see what questions we have, um, if any, and then we'll look at some of the hormones that are controlling these two states. And just to get into some of the more clinical um, correlations to these hormones and the fed and fasted state, there are a lot of diets that will tap into the understanding of how the fed state and fasted state can bring about certain metabolic effects. So for example, you have um, the intermittent fasting diets, the ketosis diets, they are all leveraging this understanding, right? That when we uh, shift away from having energy input and when our energy output exceeds energy input, then we can do things in ourselves, um, not only in terms of breaking down some of these excess storage that we have, but also other metabolic things in the cell, like cleaning up DNA and uh, making new proteins and just other things that are important in terms of our uh, metabolic balance. Okay, let's look at the states here again, and let's talk about the hormones that are being used to regulate our um, fed and fasted state. Now, insulin is the hormone of the absorptive state, and glucagon is the hormone of the post-absorptive state. So these are antagonistic hormones. 
And so when we're in our absorptive state, we have an excess of insulin being secreted. This kind of makes sense, right? Insulin is required in order to take glucose up from the blood and store it in some of those areas that we talked about. So in the fed state is when we want to have insulin around so that we can mobilize that glucose, use it when, for what we need immediately, and then mobilize the rest into storage. Other important hormones that are regulating is epinephrine and uh, norepinephrine to some degree, and just the sympathetic nervous system in general. Let's look at the role of insulin. So insulin is secreted by the islets of Langerhans cells. These are a cluster of cells that are found in the pancreas. So we mentioned this earlier, the pancreas actually has two types of tissue. It has the exocrine portion, which secretes the enzymes that help to break down the food in our GI tract. And then has these little clusters of cells which have an endocrine for a function. And the difference between exocrine and endocrine, just to touch on this here, exocrine secretions are released into ducts. So notice that the cells of the exocrine portion of the gland have these ducts in the middle, whereas endocrine glands release their hormones into the blood. Okay, notice there's a, there's a excess or abundance of blood vessels interspersed throughout the islets. This is how that insulin can be released into the blood. Insulin is going to help build up energy stores. So it is an anabolic hormone. It's gonna help make turn glucose into glycogen as well as triglyceride. It's also going to promote glucose use for energy in storage molecules. So it's gonna help uptake that glucose by the cells of our body that can use it immediately. So immediate use of glucose as well as storage of glucose into glycogen and triglycerides. The other thing that insulin was, will do in terms of being an antagonistic hormone is that it's going to decrease catabolism. So not only is it increasing the anabolic effects in the body, which is building up, storing up, but it's also decreasing the catabolic effects in our body, right? This is why when we are in an excess insulin state, it's really hard to break down fats because insulin is pretty much blocking that catabolic effect. Um, the other things that insulin does in terms of the absorptive state is to increase glucose in the plasma, increase amino acids in the plasma, uh, or these are some triggers rather for insulin release. Um, the parasympathetic nervous system, which makes sense. Some of the things we've talked about is that is going to control the rest and digest. So when we have a large meal, we're going to stimulate insulin release so that that food can be absorbed and stored appropriately. Also, glucose-independent glucose dependent insulinotrophic peptide, or GIP, is another hormone that is stimulated upon the re release of insulin. In the post-absorptive state, the sympathetic nervous system is going to be triggered, as well as the release of epinephrine, um, just as a way to antagonize some of the actions of insulin. So another way to say this is that insulin secretion is up in the absorptive state and insulin secretion is down in the post-absorptive or fasted state. And this is another thing that we can leverage in some of the diets and some of the um, lifestyle um, regimen that are uh, coming out these days is that insulin is blocking fat breakdown. Insulin is blocking the catabolism of uh, fat to make energy. And so we can leverage that understanding by being on diets that will keep our insulin levels very low. All right, let's look at the beta cells in the pancreas which secrete that insulin and some of the effects of insulin release. So increased insulin in the blood is going to increase glucose uptake everywhere except the liver and brain in our exercising muscle. It's gonna increase amino acid uptake. It's going to increase protein synthesis or protein storage. And then it's going to decrease protein breakdown. In our fatty tissues, it's gonna increase fatty acid synthesis, which is fatty acid storage, right? Storing that up into our adipose tissue and liver. It's also likewise going to block fat breakdown, right? It's gonna block lipolysis. 
In liver and muscle, it's going to increase glycogen synthesis, which is storing that glucose as glycogen. And then it's going to block glycogen breakdown or glycogenolysis. In the liver, it's doing the same thing as it does in adipose tissue, which is increasing fatty acid and triglyceride synthesis or storage, and then blocking or decreasing gluconeogenesis. And gluconeogenesis is the pathway by which we can use uh, proteins and shuttle them off to make fat, right? To make triglycerides. So that is gonna be blocked as well. So essentially, Insulin is increasing our storage of our biomolecules and then blocking the breakdown of the storage forms of these biomolecules. Let's look at the antagonistic hormone, so the exact opposite role of insulin. This is glucagon. Glucagon is secreted by the alpha cells of the irex, right? whereas insulin is coming from the beta cells. Now, glucagon is going to promote glucose sparing, especially for the nervous system, right, the brain tissue. It's going to mobilize energy stores. It's going to promote glycogenolysis, promote lipolysis, as well as promote the synthesis of new glucose, which is that gluconeogenesis. On the other hand, it can be considered a, a catabolic hormone, and it's also going to be blocking the anabolic effects, which are coming from insulin. So the big picture here is that glucagon is going to be breaking things down. It's the hormone of the fasted state. And so when we have excess levels of glucagon, we're tapping into our fat stores in the adipose tissue, tapping into glycogen in the liver, tapping into all of our stored biomolecules and liberating those for energy. All right, now glucagon secretion will happen in response to the sympathetic nervous system as well. So if you are in a fight or flight state, if you're really nervous or anxious, you're gonna start using more of that gluc glucagon and you're gonna start breaking down those storage forms to make uh, energy. This is what we leverage when we talk about exercise. This is why exercise is so powerful because it mimics the sympathetic nervous system, increases our heart rate, increases blood flow to the peripheral organs, uh, increases epinephrine itself being released. And so that is going to uh, mimic the, the uh, post-absorptive state and help our body to break down those storage forms and use that as energy. Um, glucagon secretion is also going to decrease in the absorptive state. So again, that's that antagonistic role that these hormones have. And so it's going to increase as a result of increased glucose in the plasma. In other words, having too much glucose in the plasma is going to be a stimulatory um, or a trigger for glucagon release. So here are the... Uh, functions of glucagon. Again, it's coming from alpha cells in the pancreas. It's going to help break down the storage that's happening in the liver. So increase of glycogenolysis, which is breaking down glycogen to make glucose. Likewise, blocking glycogen synthesis. So notice how it's having that double effect. So it's increasing the breakdown of glycogen and blocking the storage of glycogen. Uh, it's increasing gluconeogenesis, increasing ketone synthesis, increasing protein breakdown, and then also blocking protein storage or protein synthesis. In our adipose tissue, it's encouraging lipolysis, right, to break down those fatty tissues and release triglycerides. And then it's also blocking triglyceride synthesis, which is, again, is a not, another uh, powerful uh, mechanism that we can leverage, for example, in things like obesity. We want to be able to increase the breakdown of fats and then block the fat storage or triglyceride synthesis. All right. Now, the negative feedback of our blood pressure is also um, something that is of consequence when you look at insulin and glucagon. When we think about insulin, it is released as a re response to increase blood glucose levels, and then glucagon is released as a response to decrease blood glucose levels. So our normal blood glucose should be anywhere between 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. That's our normal uh, blood glucose levels. And this is fasting. So after you've had a meal, your blood glucose should balance back to this level. If we think about hyperglycemia, we have a glucose level of 140 and higher. 
And anything above 180 to 200, this is where we get into the diabetic range. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum is hypoglycemia, which is where blood glucose levels dip below 60 milligrams per deciliter. And so blood glucose levels are maintained by the actions of insulin and glucagon. This is what's happening under the normal circumstances. So we can begin to see that if someone is chronically in the fed state, they have chronic high levels of insulin, then there's gonna be an excess of that uh, insulin circulated in the blood and insulin is going to lose its sensitivity. Our tissues are going to lose their sensitivity to insulin. And this is where we get into things like insulin insensitivity, which is where although we have levels of insulin in the blood, the cells are not using glucose adequately and this will lead to things like diabetes mellitus. So this is really important as far as our homeostasis, right? We talked about this being our set point value. The body likes to be at 70 to 110. But when you look at diabetes, we have a new set point. Because of the chronic uh, uh, insulin release and insulin insensitivity, our body begins to establish a higher blood glucose as our set point, and it will strive to maintain that higher value in terms of homeostasis. All right, um, this final flow chart here is just comparing what's happening on both ends of the spectrum. Um, so what is happening as a response to increased plasma glucose? We have insulin being released from the beta cells. We have glucose being uptake, uptaken into our cells or stored. We have glycogen being synthesized and glycogenolysis being blocked. And then we have a blockage of gluconeogenesis. All of that results in a decrease in our blood plasma glucose. Okay, so this is a normal, healthy response that should happen when we have um, a meal that has glucose, right? Let's say we have something that's sweet, uh, maybe cake or a donut. This is what should normally happen. Our beta cells should release enough insulin so that we can utilize that glucose and that will decrease the level of glucose in our blood. Of course, if you have diabetes, this decrease doesn't happen. Why? Because our body's at a new set point. So we uptake that glucose. We have so much insulin flooded in the system already. Our tissues are no longer responsive or sensitive to that insulin. And so this drop in glucose doesn't happen. This is what happens when you look at the uh, glucose test. When you send someone for that fasted glucose test, you give them a meal, you wait for a certain period of time, and then you measure the glucose and it should have decreased if this process is happening appropriately. If we don't see that drop in blood glucose, this is where we begin to worry about things like diabetes. All right, now as homework, I want you guys to look at the other end of the uh, spectrum here, if we have low plasma glucose levels, and I want you to try to predict some of the consequences that you would expect to see. Um, so as your homework for the weekend, um, Think about what you would expect to see in terms of the beta cells in the pancreas, right? Or what other cell might have an increased secretion. Think about what you would expect to see in your tissues. What would be increased? What processes or um, what might be blocked in terms of the response in our different tissues? Okay, um, here's another helpful sort of summary or study table. It's looking at what's being released from the hypothalamus. Uh, and the anterior pituitary, what's happening in the posterior pituitary, and then what's happening in each of our endocrine glands. So the parathyroid, the adrenals, the gonads. Again, I want you to have more of a big picture understanding of the various hormones, the various glands, and the axes. We will look at each of these individually and we'll talk about the various systems, such as the reproductive system, the kidneys next year. Um, but I do want you to have an understanding more so of the hypothalamic role and the pituitary role in this axis. Okay, and then as far as our metabolic uh, balance and the absorptive and post-absorptive states, here is another summary table that shows the role of insulin, the role of glucagon, and how those can change in our different metabolic states. So another way for you to study this 
and sort of predict what's going to happen. I would encourage you to block out some of the columns in this table and try to recall just from your reasoning. So not memorizing it, but from your own understanding of what's happening, try to recall or predict what you would expect in each of these columns, just as a way to test yourself on this. All right, um, we have three minutes. So let's utilize that for a few questions. Um, so I'm gonna launch a poll here. And then as usual, I'll give you a minute. Hopefully we can get through two or three of these. All right, six seconds left. All right, so this is asking which gland releases glucocorticoids such as cortisol in response to increased adrenocorticotrophic hormone from the anterior pituitary. So this is the glucocorticoid cortisol axis, and this is going to be the adrenal cortex, all right? The thyroid gland is gonna be TRH, TSH, and T3, T4. The adrenal medulla is not involved in the endocrine system at all. That's gonna be the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. The pituitary gland is going to be secreting the trophic hormones. So that's gonna be your TSH, um, ACTH, et cetera. And then the adrenal cortex is gonna be the one that's secreting the adrenal corticotrophic hormones, such as cortisol, androgens, which are the sex hormones um, from the cortex of the adrenal gland. All right. Okay, so D is the correct response here. Um, let's look at another here. Okay, um, so what is the primary function of thyroid hormones? I think most of you selected B, regulating the body's metabolic weight. If you look at some of the other options, decreasing blood calcium levels, this is parathyroid hormone. Um, stimulating the hunger sensation, we haven't talked about a hormone that does that, but that would be ghrelin. Uh, regulating sodium reabsorption in the kidney, that would be your um, angiotensin as well as aldosterone, which is coming from the adrenal cortex. And so B is going to be the response of the thyroid hormones, increasing or regulating the metabolic weight, right? That calorogenic effect. 